I want to invite Dr. David Bentley Hart to come and join me up front here. Please, uh, please welcome him to Latimer House. Let me, let me say a bit about David as uh, we sit down to have a, a conversation. And tonight, by the way, there will be another event. And this, the, the event uh, tonight, David will be lecturing uh, on Christianity and its fashionable enemies. This is kind of a, we're sort of plagiarizing the subtitle of his book called Atheist Delusions. If you have not read it, you should. It's brilliant and it's a... Uh, uh, it's it's a romp. I mean, David is uh, is is quite witty and a joy um, to read. But I think uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, I confess, I was not really familiar with David when a friend of mine called me from the UK to say, "Have you read this book, Atheist Delusions?" And I said, "I, I have not." And uh, he said, "You know, you'll want to look at this. It's it's very interesting." And um, Kindle being what it is, I just got off the phone and I downloaded it right there. It's a little advertisement for Kindle and uh, electronic reader. And uh, I began, uh, uh, and, and I couldn't put it down because I thought it was, I thought it was intelligent uh, and I thought it was witty uh, and it was very accessible. So uh, that, that is to say not everyone writing on these issues writes in a way that ordinary people you know, really find it interesting. And I think you'll find that... Uh, that David has an ability, certainly, to, to write for other academics, but he also has an ability, a gift, really, um, to speak at a level that, uh, that you don't have to be a specialist to enjoy or appreciate what he has to say. But, David, let's, let's just begin. Maybe you could just tell us just a little bit about yourself, um, your background, your education, and, uh, and maybe what got you started in writing on issues like this. Oh. Okay, uh, the first thing I'll tell you about uh, myself is that I have a terrific sore throat uh, <laughs> of, of hay fever. So if I begin to get a bit inaudible, although this sounds pretty loud, uh, forgive me. I, I'm, I'm going to do my best to project. Um, and he's heavily drugged, I might also. Well, the other thing is I, I took an antihistamine, which apparently was three quarters morphine or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's like a three martini lunch in a, in a pill. Uh, so excuse me if I'm if I if I'm a little bit uh, distracted looking. It's uh, although somewhat sharper than usual. Uh, I I just started writing on these. Frankly, th th these topics, specifically the topic of the last book, by accident. I, I don't really have any interest in the new atheist literature. Um, to be honest, it's, I don't think the books have been very good uh, as yet. Someone may come along. Uh, who produces something somewhat more substantial, but the, the popular the popular atheist literature at the moment that didn't really interest me very much. I was really much more interested in writing a book about uh, the transformation of culture uh, in the early empire when Christianity was expanding for its first four centuries and about the collapse of Christendom in the modern period, although I wrote the history backwards. Uh, this past uh, year, I've been drawn into the New Atheist uh, issues, in part because Yale gave my book that title, Atheist Illusions. That was not the title I wrote for it. Uh, but it, 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 it did begin, it de deal at the beginning and the end, and at the end with the New Atheists as a sort of framing device. And I found that the debate actually is much more serious and alive and vibrant than I had realized at first. I had dismissed the New Atheist movement as just an annoyance, to be honest because in the academic world, that's the way it's treated. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, no one takes Richard Dawkins seriously as a philosopher, because he's not interested in learning how to do that. Uh, but, but then, uh, when I was dragged out of the ivory tower, uh, I realized that, that, in fact, this is a serious debate with serious cultural ramifications that's, that's, that's happening at large in the media, but also uh, much more subtly in people's homes and lives. So. Well, we want to talk about those ramifications. I mean, our, our, our topic today is the future of the West, and certainly there is a rising tide of secularism. But as we get to that, let's, let's define our terms just a little bit. I'm sure there are many here who have no idea who the new atheists are. Why don't you tell them a bit about them? Well, um, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens are the most famous, uh, and just after them, I suppose, Sam Harris um, who's sort of, an ex, uh, so, sort of a refugee from a boys' school who got lucky 
and wrote a book that became a bestseller, but he's, you know, he's really just an undergraduate and he writes like one. Um, and then there's Daniel Dennett, who's, uh, you know, a respected uh, philosopher at Tufts University, who's r who really writes about the philosophy of science, and who writes very large books that don't hold together very well. I mean, I'm just being honest here. I, I'm not a nice person. So I mean, uh, Dennett, uh, Dennett is a bad philosopher, but he is, he is one who knows a lot. Not a lot of history. He always makes mistakes there. But he's the most substantial and also the most boring of those four. Um, and then there are a lot of other figures, the peripheries, like A.C. Grayling, another English philosopher. And, other. and the principle, uh, w what, what distinguishes the new atheists, I suppose, as a distinct movement is the evangelical zeal of their atheism. They really believe that this is a cultural moment. And I think for them the cultural moment ca came on 9-11, 2001. This is a cultural moment in which atheists can step forward from the shadows and not simply say that they're not believers, but that religious belief is in its essence something destructive, irrational, violent, and that should be suppressed not only by rational argument, but even by law. Many of them have ventured such claims. But for the most part, I mean, what, what makes them is they really feel this is the moment when, when atheism has to become a triumphalist philosophy uh, that, that, that really makes war on what they see as the, 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 the citadel of unreason that religion is. As, uh, as David has pointed out, effectively <coughs> they, they would see um, that there's very little nuance here. They would see all religions uh, as essentially the same, irrational and uh, um, uh, fundamentally undermining uh, civilized society. Of course, a more nuanced view of the issue would say, well, what does, uh, what does the shoe bomber, um, the 77 subway bombers, 9-11, the bombing of the USS Cole, the, the uh, attempted bombing of Tom's, Times Square, what do these things have in common? Radical Islam. But you see, they, they don't see it in, in, in quite that way. Let's. Let's uh, back up just, just a little bit. Now, now we're, we're speaking of these, these four, um, again, the so-called new atheists and those who are on the, uh, the periphery. What, what kind of impact? I mean, these are, these are all academic guys, David. What, what kind of impact are they really having at a popular cultural level? Yeah, uh, well, I wouldn't call Christopher Hitchens an academic guy. He's, he's, he's a journalist um, uh, and... And, and very and very widely. Read I was one. being kind. He would call himself as academic. Yeah, he teaches journalism courses in, in California. Uh, but that's not the same thing as being a scholar. You know, no, not to be bigoted here. You know, <laughs> but but uh, come on. I mean, but, but anyway, um, uh, the impact is as I said, it's 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 more diffuse uh, and more powerful than I realized. Um, in part, they play on. I mean, most people don't have the time. It, it is perfectly understandable. Most people don't have the time to check their footnotes, or to, or, or really to spend their life uh, sort of ruining their eyesight in library stacks, looking up obscure eighth-century texts in order to get the details right. So, there's no reason why a, a popular readership should know when statements of a fact are simply wrong in their books. Nor is it to be expected that everyone's going to have sat through um, long courses in fundamental logic or the problems of philosophy. So, in general, they make their appeal rhetorically, uh, polemically. The argument, as I say, if if one really takes any of the any of the books in this in this this genre and subjects it to serious, uh, serious critique. Uh, you know, it's philosophical content, it's historical content. The, bo the book doesn't survive that process. And again, as I say, I, in my, my daydreaming way, uh, living very much in the academic world, that seemed to me to be all that needed to be said. But they, uh, they really have touched a nerve. They obviously know that there is a serious um, moral passion on the part of many people who do not believe or who do not want to believe, um, who really, like them, feel that, that, that the forces of faith have been uh, something destructive and, 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 and more destructive than creative in human history, and that 
the, the only hope, and this is a real moral pathos, that the only hope for humanity now is to reclaim the enlightenment heritage of throwing off the shackles of irrational faith and, and, and seeking to create a future that's been purged of any belief in transcendence or the supernatural. Because, and, and this is something they all share in common, a sort of strange moral complacency that says that a truly secular culture would have nothing to, to fight about and therefore would, na would naturally eventuate in, a, in a, a society that's harmonious, reasonable, and happy. You know. so, um, so then what's new about the, the new atheists? Their books are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that as a serious argument. What, 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 there's something, in, there's something uh, interesting in this. Atheism has a somewhat distinguished intellectual history in, in modernity. Going back to the, the 16th century, 15th century, you could see it stirring already in very early modernity. Atheism used to be a very serious moral intellectual project, or at least skepticism was. And, and, and when you read, say, Diderot, oh, well, some of the arguments are rather fatuous, but they're based on a knowledge of of, of what Christians believe, of what the stakes are. When you read uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, this man was a moralist, um, and he understood the consequences of what he was saying. He knew the history of Christianity, he knew the history of antiquity, he knew what moral values Christianity had brought into the world, he understood that moral values are not something that are just residing in nature to be found like species of butterflies, but are, are, are in fact cultural traditions, and he knew that the, that the rejection of faith would have consequences that some people would regard as monstrous if they f were willing to follow them out to the end. So he was struggling with serious ideas, serious concerns, and was acting out of, of a passion for stating the truth as honestly as possible. Not he was not a triumphalist atheist. In fact, he, he had considerable apprehensions about the future. Well, and, and that's part of what's new about the new atheism but the is new the atheism, marketing. Yeah, is, the is the marketing. That is, is, that, is that really, um, in the new atheist literature, you would think that the question of belief or unbelief is, a sim is as simple, ultimately, as the question of what color drapes you're going to buy. Uh, with, of course, there only being one correct answer, uh, light mauve. And... Um, <laughs> And if you choose orange, you're, you're clearly an irrational barbarian. But at the end of the day, there is this sort of strange fatuousness. In it. And, I, and, I, and this puzzled me, to be honest, because I would think that if you're passionately committed to unbelief, you would have some curiosity about the consequences of that commitment. And I, I think the thing that makes it most interesting is that... Uh, um, is that most of this literature is written as if the 20th century never occurred. As if the really happy optimism of the, of, of the more unreflective enlightenment thinkers, that, you know, that, that there's no question that morality is something that all rational people can agree on once you've thrown off the burden of faith. Um, you know, as, as if we haven't seen that there are certain reasons to wonder whether the project of modernity uh, might, might in itself harbor certain areas of darkness. Um, there's just this strange moral complacency, a certainty in, in, the, in, in, in the availability of rational ethics. Sorry. Something about the, uh, I would add to that just slightly, that, that, that another aspect to the new atheism that is, that is new, and, and, and he's touched on it uh, some here, is it's, it's marketing, <coughs> you see. You know, if you think of a generation ago, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, uh, and there were, she won very few converts. Uh, now you have this, this suave, uh, hip generation of Oxford-educated, uh, English-accented um, academics who come along and who have really rather effectively, whether, whether we think the books are good or not, uh, and I, I agree with his assessment uh, of the books, they, they have certainly been gobbled up uh, by many in our culture, by particularly young people, but um, thinking about the, uh, their claims, they would say that religion is irrational and dangerous. This is, a, this is a primary argument that they would make. How do you respond to that claim? 
Well, it, this, in fact, is a central claim. Well, I mean, the problem is there are certain terms there that have to be defined, like religion and rational. And this is something that, that uh, unfortunately, these books never get around to. There's no such thing as religion, right? I mean, uh, there are faiths and there are practices. Um, for them, it's convenient to say that a, a shaman, a jain, uh, a Christian uh, going to a Methodist chapel, uh, a Muslim, are all basically engaged in the same thing with the same meaning and the same consequences. Now, to some, in some degree, this is true. All, all uh, traditions of faith are seeking after transcendent truth. But religion is, I mean, using the word religion, though, it's like using the word politics. Politics is violent, which it certainly is. Uh, but uh, it also isn't, you know. It's, it's such a wild generalization that, uh, that, it's, that it's utterly vacuous as a, as a claim. But then what rationality? Well, you know, I'm not going to... With, within the world of philosophy, the question of how reason is structured, how reason works, is something that, 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 that's, that's, that's been a, uh, an object of argument and, and uh, deep speculation for centuries on end. And only someone who's unaware of, of, of all of those conversations thinks that what reason means is a purely sort of empiricist, that is, just, just using the methods of the natural sciences as they exist now, as if they apply to every sphere of life. When in fact, what makes the sciences, modern science, so fruitful is, because, is that it's so narrow in its, in its field of, of concern. It, it, it doesn't ask questions, uh, it doesn't ask uh, philosophical questions about being or meaning or, or form or finality or any of that. It focuses on, on what can be uh, determined from a very narrow and very specific focus, but but the notion that that and that alone uh, is 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 what constitutes rationality is so so crude and so obviously false when you look into it. I mean, ninety five percent of what we know we know by other means, and yet that knowledge is firmer than our knowledge, say, of most because you know in the empirical sciences every generation can revise the theory new discoveries can be made, but there are other certitudes we possess that are far firmer than that. Um, and the, uh, the only other thing I'd say about that is, is the amazing thing about this literature is, if we take for instance Christopher Hitchens, he will point to, you know, three or four rather conspicuous cases of violence which seem to be associated with religious beliefs. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, because his examples aren't always well chosen. <coughs> As I say, he's not very scholarly. You know, what sort of argument? To, what, what sort of argument are you supposed to give him then? You're, that well, you just point to examples of religious belief leading to good and 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 kind behavior. Uh, it, it's a pointless argument because the problem uh, is th is that they want to ascribe all the evil that they see bearing the name of religion to the systems of faith themselves, rather than to the humanity of those who hold those systems, which would seem to imply that, 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 that violence and irrationality is not to be found outside the sphere of faith, whereas we know it is, and on a far greater scale if the 20th century is to be credited as, as a evidence of what human beings are capable of. Well, well let, let's take one of the examples, uh -huh. a, a very current example that they would seize upon. To what extent uh, has, let's say, the... Uh, the child abuse scandal in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, that, that has given real impetus to detractors of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it legitimate? Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's about as evil as anything can be. So, yeah, it's legitimate as, as, as a criticism of, of the institutional inertia of the churches that have that have allowed this to happen when they they did have the the, the ability to stop it, and that it's clearly the case that that's so. Uh, and uh, it, trying, however, logically to draw a link between that and faith in Christ, of course, is is again just a sort of polemical trick. It, it doesn't mean anything. But yeah, it's done incredible damage, um, and I've seen from the inside. I just happen to know of a case of this. Uh, my own experience in recent years, when I w having to do with the uh, 
Dominican province of uh, St. Joseph in its way, it, 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 assigning a, a, a known pedophile basically to be a youth minister at a local church. So, uh, yeah, I'm all for moral rage against that. Um, uh, hatred even, if not of persons, at least of their actions. But, but at the end of the day, uh, if, if you're simply then going to make the cheap argument that, that, say, Richard Dawkins has made, that this flows naturally from, from the authoritarianism or the, uh, the, uh, some sort of cruelty that's implicit in the very teachings of the gospel, then obviously he's saying something that's objectively false. But that doesn't change the perception. I mean, it is, it's done incredible damage. Where does the, uh, the moral basis come from with which to condemn the actions of those child-abusing priests? Well, from the Christian tradition of which all the new atheists are inheritors. <laughs> I mean, well, that's what I think. I mean, this is, this is, this is the great issue, is, is that the, the belief that... that um, I mean, it really is. I, I, Daniel Dennett's a wonderful example of this. He really just thinks that, um, that uh, and almost unconsciously so, seems to think that there are moral truths that all human beings throughout time have agreed on that are just obvious. Now, on the, uh, th that's when he's wearing one hat. When he's wearing another, he, he will make a purely Darwinian uh, statement about how morality evolves. But at the end of the day, he really seems to think that you can subtract the transcendent from your understanding of morality and then still have the same ethical prejudices in place generation after generation after generation because they're just reasonable. Dan needs to get out more. It seems to, uh, it, 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 it seems to me that in my conversations with many of these a atheists like Hitchens, like Dawkins, uh, Peter Singer is another one that we, we haven't mentioned here, that when I hear them speak of the Christian faith, their, their caricature of what Christianity is, it seems that the one thing that they don't get is grace, that they see a God of, uh, of tyranny, of rules, of regulations. Uh, w w would you agree with that assessment? Oh, well, you know, I mean, there's no question that that's what they understand all religion to be a system of prohibitions and attempts to mold minds into tractable, ductile vessels of some, some authorities' uh, view of how they should be behave and what they should believe. That, that they're systems of power. And so, no, the, the notion of grace is absent. Now, whose fault is that? Well, obviously, that's got to be the fault of believers, too. I mean, to be perfectly honest, because throughout the history of every faith, with, with, of any size, uh, let's say, of any, of, any, of any complexity, that's precisely what religion often has been. It's not as if the, this is a pure fantasy. Um, th there are forms of uh, Christian belief which, which fit perfect, or forms of Christian practice, which perfectly conform to that caricature. The problem is that that's all they know, yeah. and, and they're utterly indiscriminate in how they ascribe that... Uh, to Christians or believers of any stripe, and there is this absolute ignorance, I would say, of, of, of the, 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 well, you're speaking specifically of Christianity when you invoke grace. Yes. I mean, there are ideas yes. of grace in other faiths. Um, that, that, that entire aspect of it, that, that, it, that it is the condescending love of God, the self-outpouring love of God, not, not um, obedience to the law, which transforms or redeems or reconciles creation to God is unknown to them. They simply, they, they don't have that sort of concept, that, that sort of, or I wouldn't say sophisticated, but simple understanding of Christian belief. This is a profound point, and I would, I would want to drive it home just a bit, that, that as David has indicated, we, we tend towards, uh, and I, of course I speak here anecdotally, but we t tend towards a, a, and I'm speaking just to Christians here, by the way, that those of you who aren't part of the Christian faith, you, you kind of listen in as I, as, as I, I make a point here to, uh, to those uh, Christians who are present. But uh, uh, we certainly tend towards legalism. And uh, any religion of size uh, eventually moves in that direction towards a kind of self-justification uh, if you will. And uh, in Christianity, by definition, there needs to be an emphasis on grace. That is to say that, that, that you don't earn salvation, you don't earn um, God's love, but rather that, that he bestows it 
on on us, even though we've done nothing um, to to earn it. There is a there is an effort, David, to establish both in this country and in in Europe a morality apart from God. Uh, let, let's imagine for just a moment. Maybe you don't have as a as a historian. Perhaps you don't have to imagine a great deal. I'm not an historian. Uh, well, you're a, a historian of sorts. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Now I should get another salary. There we go. <laughs> Imagine with me for a moment what a world like that would look like. Well, I don't. I, you know, I, I, I don't know um, how, how, how you you do that. Um, the thing we have to understand is there's th- th- that such a society has not yet existed, even in Europe. Um, so what it would look like is very hard to predict. Uh, one thing I, I, I know is this, is that it is nonsense to believe that moral values are not embedded in certain narratives of reality. That what we understand reality to be determines ultimately what we believe the good to be, what our actions are, the degree to which our, our own actions are of vital importance. So what I would say is there's no way of predicting. So this is actually, this is the real naivete of, of many of the new atheists. They simply assume they know the shape that such a world would take. We have considerable evidence of the, over the past uh, hundred years uh, that, that, that it's foolish to have any firm faith in uh, <laughs> uh, the moral capacities of, of, of humanity <coughs> or of the secular project. But I, I don't know. I mean, I really, I, I don't know what such a world would look like, except that it would probably be somewhat boring. And, and that's, not, that's, not, that's not a flippant remark. Uh, there is a kind of, and, and, uh, and I've, you know, anyone who's lived in Western Europe for any length of time knows this. There is a kind of metaphysical boredom that settles on a culture that, is, that really believes that the material level of existence is the whole of reality. Now, I, I can give any number of philosophical arguments why I believe that's incoherent. I think that materialism is philosophically an impossible, logically impossible position. But that's not the question. It's a cultural climate. Is that metaphysical boredom is incredibly destructive. It's destructive of <coughs> culture and society and of, and of the sense of, of, of moral obligation. I, I believe that the, such persons are perfectly sincere. I believe that in, 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 in Europe there is a, a great, even desperate desire to find a grammar, a, a moral grammar that's pluralist, inclusive, uh, provident, kind, rational, um, not vengeful. I still tend to think that all of these are, are vestiges of the language of Christianity which have, have a kind of ghostly after existence in a culture that cannot find uh, um, a firm basis for them elsewhere and cannot embody them nearly as well as they'd like to. And I tend to believe, I think almost inevitably, that once the narrative that sustained that moral impulse fades away, other narratives will take its place, and the morality will alter, will mutate. And that it's very, uh, you know, it's a sort of hopeless task to believe that you can really create the sort of perfectly just society they desire in the terms in which they desire it, that it's simply, it's an internal contradiction to itself. Well, and and this is really getting at at, at my question. Maybe I should narrow it just a bit. I'm I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a culture that has been bled of meaningful Christian influence. Um, what, what does a culture like that look like? Let, let me give you an example. This is a, Richard Dawkins recently made this statement. It's a rather stunning statement, and I, and I think it comes as a result. You, you can, you'll find it in this uh, here by, under the heading Times, the, the Times. This is, I think, a, a, a result of a conversation that the two of us had, but this is a stunning reversal of his previous position. He says this, There are no Christians, as far as I know, blowing up buildings. I'm not aware of any Christian suicide bombers. I'm not aware of any major Christian denomination that believes the penalty for apostasy is death. I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity insofar as Christianity might be a bulwark against something worse. Now, going back to my question, 
there are efforts to remove meaningful Christian influence from society, if only by way, you all experience this, hey, you're allowed to, to be Christians, but keep it private. It's mm -hmm. like smoking, right? You, you do it in the designated areas. But don't bring it into the schools. Don't bring it into work. Don't bring it into the public space. What does a culture look like that he, he's suggesting maybe we need it? to uh, inoculate us against something worse. What, what does it look like? Can, you, would, would you dare speculate? No. <laughs> I'll give the same answer. No. I, except, as I say, that, uh, that, that the actual values will not remain stable. The, 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 the moral realities they presume are not there apart from belief in the transcendent. So, um, uh, you know, you might come up with a very anodyne, very bland, very habitable sort of society over the short term, I have no idea, um, but I, I, I do believe that that I've, I mean, for two reasons that that, that there are good <laughs> there's good calls for apprehension that this will not be the case. One, as I say, is just that the secular project, from its origins, I mean the, the way we're taught to think of this history is by the new atheists, but also by standard history, really is that the, the modern period was a liberation from the blood, you know, the, the bloody past of, of religious sectarianism in, in Europe from years and years. We talk about the wars of the 16th and 17th centuries as the wars of religion. But they weren't wars of religion. Everyone knows, they're, they're, I mean, every good historian knows that these are the wars of the, of the new nation state. They're the wars that had to be fought for the secular nation state to break free from the from from the myth it had become a myth at that time but also a legal structure of Christendom and they were the most violent wars ever fought on European soil for their time and they eventuated in ever more violent conflicts until finally the, the great world wars and this is now w we can ascribe it to any number of historical causes and we and we can be as subtle as we like but the truth is that that history instructs us that, that the, project, the secular project, the emergence of the nation state and the civil society as we know it, in which you have a very powerful centralized state and you have individuals invested with certain rights and that, that everything that of consequence I is, is, is enacted between those two poles and everything else, like religion, is pushed away because it's divisive and sectarian, did not give us what we were promised, did not lead us into an age of peace and harmony. It led us into oceans of human blood. And so any sort of complacency on, uh, 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 the, the, of, of that sort, which says that we can, re, you know, we, we, that we have good cause to believe that, that a world purged of belief in the, in, the, in the eye of God on us is going to lead to, to, the, to this radiant utopia of which they speak or, or for which they hope, it just it just seems childish, but the other thing is I, I again and here this is the problem of living in the academic world is that the way ideas work I'm firmly convinced is that many of the great changes in cultural history occur in a very obscure way at first they happen in monastic cells at one time in the uh, university foundations of the church but now in the academic world and then over generations they metastasize. You know, they, they move out into the greater culture. That a lot of great cultural changes are not just the effects of material changes, economies, uh, societies, wars, but are ideas. And anyone who lives in the academic world knows that the sort of ideas that have begun to germinate there, in, for those, like Peter Singer being a good example, yep. are shockingly inhuman. Uh, you would be Ap most of you who haven't read in the li literature of academic bioethics, I think, would be shocked and I hope repelled by much of what passes as, co as, as acceptable common reason there. Peter Singer is a good example of someone who thinks, well, you know, uh, if you, you know, have a baby and you're not have a sort of defective baby, you can, there should be a period when infanticide is, is legal. And he's argued that, you know, uh, uh, you know cannibalism isn't morally worse than <laughs> any other sort of meat eating. He's, 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 he's a moderate in the world of bioethics. We will, by the way. He's, he's bioethicist at Princeton University, and we will be debating him in uh, Melbourne, Australia um, next spring in all probability. <laughs> so I'll get your tickets now. Uh, that's right. There you go. And, and, and I guess a plane ticket. Um, 
David is uh, is much more of an academic than I am, and uh, and therefore perhaps more reluctant to uh, to speculate. I will speculate as to what a world like that will look like, uh, because I do think we have historical models for what a world like that would look like. It's a graceless world. And in a world where there are multiple narratives, there are multiple truths, there must be an overriding truth. And that truth, of course, becomes a supreme state yeah. that imposes morality and itself becomes uh, its own compass, you see. And, uh, and though we find models like that in places like North Korea and, and China and uh, in Eastern Europe and and so forth, but it is a it is a graceless society that is bled of meaningful Christian influence, and uh, and it would I would speculate that that's that's the direction we are drifting in the Western world, unless Christianity is to reassert itself, unless Christians like you are to uh, to to have a meaningful impact on the culture itself. You want to comment? Yeah, no, I grant all that. Sorry, I didn't mean I, I, I'm being I'm being too coy here. Uh, yeah, no, obviously that's, uh, w- what's the great age of the, the liberal, con- I mean liberal in the classical sense, the liberal consensus is that if you, um, uh, if you remove uh, what are now the private fixations of religion from the public <laughs> realm, the public realm should be a shared space where, where people engage with one another in a condition of total neutrality. Now that's a myth, that never actually happens. There's no such thing as private belief that isn't also public belief. But, but this is the myth. Well, in such a situation, then, there really has to be some arbiter who guards the neutrality of the public sphere and does it by ever more heavy-handed means. Oh, I've said, my, my goodness. Um, again, uh, uh, on co- in continental Europe, you see this, uh, but also here. Um, a control of speech, control of ideas, control even of, in a sense of association is very subtle. But it's not necessarily, it's not going to look like North Korea necessarily. We're, we're, you know, we come from a different cultural background. It's a much subtler thing. But it is, yeah, it is, it is the emergence of the state as, as uh, the state as the center of all authority, all legitimacy, and of, 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 of even moral authority. You know, the state will tell you more. I mean, many of these new atheists believe, for instance, that it should be illegal to raise children in any tradition of faith. <coughs> now, that's a fascist belief, but they think it's a good, liberal, humane way of protecting children against the insidious effect of irrational fideism. Okay? What in fact it is, 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 is it's the state claiming ownership of children. So all citizens become the property of the state, but not one of them will back away from this suggestion. Um, so yeah, that's true. The, the modernity, the modern age is about the emergence of the state and then the fiction <coughs> that the individual and the state are the mutually sustaining poles of reality and everything in between, community, special sorts of community like community of faith, all of that, that has no legitimacy in the determination of the shape of culture or society. That's a private thing. It's the individual and the state, which means it's the state. Well, and, and Christianity's influence here, just in, in case you're wondering, where, where you, you, maybe some of you, there's a disconnect. Well, what, what is Christianity's influence on the state itself? Well, certainly in, in the forming and shaping of laws, but particularly how we see uh, individuals, the dignity of the individual. Uh, an individual is, is, is deemed, in, in some sense, we were talking earlier about some of the, the contradictions uh, among the new atheists and that they have been, as he's noted, uh, heavily influenced by a Judeo-Christian worldview. Uh, Hitchens, for instance, has acknowledged that he's not prepared to see uh, um, children euthanized. And uh, why is that? That's well, he also, he, also, he yeah. also acknowledges that that's inconsistent with an atheist view. Uh, that he's, as opposed to, uh, to Singer, why is that? Well, because he's in, been influenced in that way that human beings have a certain dignity, and we have always operated from a certain premise in the West that human beings are not strictly material, you see. And in a world where human beings are seen as strictly material, you are a commodity to serve the state rather than the state serving a dignified individual. There's a, there's a major distinction there. Do you see Islam as playing any role in the future de- de- development of the West, in a, a real meaningful role in the development of the West? Well, I think it's going to be, co- uh, well, you know, again, here's, here's another word. What do you mean by Islam? Um, 
Um, a true academic. <laughs> I just spent, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I just spent a long time with uh, a, a great number of Muslim scholars. At the, the Archbishop of Canterbury has a yearly conference, Muslims and Christians together. And you're dealing there with a very uh, educated, and sometimes, some cases, westernized, but a very traditional sort of Muslim who, who, uh, uh, who's heritage is from before the, the rise of the, uh, the worst aspects of Salafi mis- Islam, you know. Um, so, but, but yeah, Islam is growing in Europe just by, by immigration and, and uh, it is more and more uh, going to, to become, I, I mean ultimately I believe it'll be the dominant practiced religion in Europe. Uh, it isn't actually at the moment as much as, as, as uh, you know, uh, some alarmists will say it is. Not quite, but it's getting there. Um, and it will influence law and it, influence, it, it influences society at the ground level just in the sense that, that some of the communities, Muslim communities, um, use a kind of, uh, of radical Islam as a way of cementing themselves into island communities that have nothing to do with larger culture. So they cut out areas, areas of t- cities in England, for instance, which are basically no-go zones for the police or for women who aren't in hijab and veil. Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, well, okay, yes. They're, they're part of this country, too. It's never going to... Uh, immigration in this country is principally Christian. And even even most Arabs in the in the states are Christian Arabs, so Syriac Orthodox or Maronite. Uh, so we don't have anything like the same uh, influx of Islamic uh, immigration into the states. Uh, it will become a more significant presence, but it will. But that's but in, in, it's not going to be as it is in France, ten percent of the population already. Um, and it, yeah, it's going to have a, a huge influence on uh, on on what is really the, the influence it's going to have in part is going to be one of a kind of a, a hopeless attempt to moderate differences. Again, the the the, the myth of the, the neutrality of the state is a myth. The state's going to want to step in and say, "Well, we're going to safeguard pluralism by keeping you know c- keeping the public sphere free of all religious interests, Christian and Muslim alike." But in practice, that's not what happens. It means, you know, uh, the bad conscience of old colonial powers doing more to suppress expressions of Christian belief, while at the same time fearing that suppressions of expression of Muslim belief will will be a sort of tyranny imposed upon an already tyrannized people. It's it's a sort of hopeless situation. It, the state, and and so it, you know, the, the state again increases its, its sphere of power, but whether it actually improves the situation. If, if you say, well, we're, we're going to stop the fight on the playground by making everyone go to his own corner, but only, only one child actually is, is, pre- is made to stay in his corner, you haven't really accomplished much. Um, I, I, I think that uh, Europe uh, in the Western Europe, I think Christianity is is moribund. I mean, I think a lived practice Christianity is more or less dead, um, and will remain so. I believe it will be uh, a minority practice. It has more intellectual respectability in the continent, though, than in, than it does in England. Believe it or not, uh, many, m- for instance, and and the French are unlike us and unlike the English in that their philosophers are actually public figures. Like there's a lot to be said for the French that's good, you know. I, I'm actually a Francophile. I just want to throw that out there. Um, and they, they get big salaries and meet beautiful women. They're, they're not, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't know how they do it. The French are a different people. Um, and but carry handbags. But yeah. <laughs> they're not handbags. <laughs> but... Um, uh, there are, you know, many philosophers who are not even believers, like Alain Bédieu and, and others, want to reclaim the Christian heritage. But they don't believe in God, you know, <laughs> but they understand. And you see this in Germany, too. Jürgen Habermas, another famous philosopher, is an atheist. He's a Marxist, really, or at least in his formation. But he's come out, you know, ad- stridently against, against uh, sort of complacent atheism that emanates so freely from England saying, well, you know, he said, Europe is Christianity, everything else is postmodern gibberish, you know, and that is an incredible statement for someone who is one of the most 
rigorous and, and consistent atheist philosophers of the 20th century. But they, 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 because they, they recognize that, that values are cultural contingencies. They come from a, a past. They, that, that what holds together their sense of the good, the true, the beautiful, is a tradition to which they belong with a master narrative that makes all those things uh, coherent and cogent and comprehensible. And they recognize that there has to be some attempt to recapture that in the face of, the, the, really, the face of the passivity of a secular, modern secular state before other cultures, like what they think, you know, Islam is what they're thinking. Um, but I don't know what resources they have for reclaiming it, because the idea that you can reclaim Christianity without belief in God <laughs> seems a might a might quixotic. Uh, yeah. Let me ask a final question. Uh, you have a deep appreciation for uh, antiquity. I, and in and, and 1513, a, a brilliant little track circulated, anonymously authored, circulated throughout Europe entitled Julius Excluded from Heaven. It was right after Pope Julius II, a very corrupt uh, pope, died. Um, authorship has been uh, attributed to Thomas More, but it was a critique of the Catholic Church by a Catholic. And in it, it's a satire and it's, it's brilliant, but in it he, he has this conversation, this, this, this conversation between Pope Julius II who arrives in heaven and the gates are closed to him. And St. Peter, simply dressed, begins to engage him in conversation and ask him, why should I let you in? And it begins this, uh, this, this rather clever dialogue where, where um, either Moore or Erasmus or whoever it was who wrote it is comparing the modern church, the, uh, the, the church of that time, with the simplicity of the apostles. Now, for, for David, my, my question is this. If, if, if something like that were written today, or, or let's, let's look at it in a slightly different way, if the, if the apostles, moving on a notch, 500 years if the apostles were to speak to us today, certainly they have, we believe, through Scripture, but what would they say to us? What, what advice might they give us? See, I wasn't willing to speculate on the future of secular society, <laughs> but, I, but I, I'm, I'm course, trying. I feel I'm perfect, trying. perfectly free to speak on behalf of the apostles. <laughs> 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 uh, well, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. I mean, I'm... Eastern Orthodox, so I'm, I'm use, I, I belong to a long tradition of institutional Christianity that is deeply embedded in imperial history, just as much as Roman Catholicism is, without quite the central structure, because Eastern people just don't do organization that way, or just don't do organization. It's, it's one of the most nice. I'm not from the East, but I'm of the, of the East. Um, and uh, but I mean I think I think the thing to realize is that uh, is is that this is a perennial problem for Christians in that the history of the triumph of Christianity is also the history of Christianity's disastrous defeat. Uh, I've never um, you know you, you have to take this to heart to understand that there's a certain ambiguity in in talking about <laughs> Christian presence in society um, because it came at a cost. It was wonderful for the cause of civilization. The values of Christianity began to enter into common consciousness, into codes of law. Didn't, didn't create a just society, but believe me, created a society that, that carried uh, uh, values of justice and mercy much farther than anything you find in antiquity. And anyone who doubts that just doesn't know the a a ancient world because there was no moral grammar uh, provided by pre-Christian culture for the things that we take for granted, that we shouldn't let our neighbor starve. Now, there were, there were philosophical schools like the Stoics that had good things to say. But it, as a rule, the notion that a culture could be oriented towards these values is something new. And it was wonderful for the transformation, the creation of a new civilization, Christendom with many blessings and many good things. It was, however, uh, also disastrous for Christian self-understanding at some level, too. It was many times a corruption of, of Christian adherence with worldly interests. I think the apostles, I don't know what they would say to us other than their recorded uh, words, 
Uh, but, but it is true that apostolic Christianity never, never anticipated. There was, they were living in a world in which this was unimaginable, that Christians could wield the sword, that Christians could confuse their loyalty to Christ with their loyalty to their, their country. And we Americans have a very bad habit of doing this. I mean, I, I was once in a Texas airport, and I found a cross that was also an American flag. Uh, and I bought it, because I just couldn't believe it. I thought, this is great. Um, but it's, it's true. I mean, this is a horrendous temptation that Christians fall into, the belief that the calls of America and the calls of Christ are somehow uh, convergent. And uh, so, I mean, I think the apostolic warning in every generation is the same. Wherever the interests of power, wherever the interests of state, wherever the interests of anything other than the love of God and neighbor, uh, claim that they, they belong uh, at the forefront of your devotions, um, you know, you have to reject that, and that includes rejecting uh, the institutional evils that uh, that we still see unfolding around us today. Um, but that's the most I could say. I'm not, not going to put words in the voice of well, the, Saint uh, Andrew. Yeah. In, in, in spite in words of the mouth. In, so. in spite of your uh, reluctance, you gave a terrific answer. Uh, please, please join me in, in in thanking him for being with us. Thank you.